Like to call to order the committee of a whole. Could, could read the roll, please. Councilmember Wood? Here. Councilmember Spadafore? Here. Councilmember Spitzley? Here. Councilmember Hussein? Here. Councilmember Washington? Here. Councilmember Garza? Councilmember Dunbar? Councilmember Jackson? Okay, Councilmember Garza has called in. He is ill. Um, I'm assuming we will have. <laughs> Councilmember Dunbar shortly um, here at the meeting. We have uh, minutes for March 11th. Madam Vice Pre President Spadafore. Madam President, I move the minutes for March 11th, 2019. We have a motion on the minutes. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Passes unanimously. <coughs> Excuse me, this is an opportunity for public comment. Anyone who would like to come up to uh, the podium and make a public comment, please give us your uh, name uh, for the record and you will have three minutes. Loretta Stanaway. Um, the public hearing for the Red Cedar development, I've got a few points I'd like to raise again and still and once more or whatever. Um, I'd like to ask if we couldn't find out from the developer how much profit is enough for this to go forward? How much profit do they have to make before they will go forward with this project? What's their bottom line? I think it's fair for us to ask that question. We should also be asking the projections that they have given us for what they expect the revenues from these developments to be. What percentage of occupancy rate are those based on? Are they assuming 50%, 60%, 95%? What are those numbers based on? And third, we should realize that by their own admission, this will not be their last time at bat. If this is approved, if the brownfield's approved, and at some point in the future they want to expand the development of the student housing, for instance, they'll be back here asking again for another brownfield because that's not included in this one. At the end of the 30 years, assuming they still own the property, what guarantee do we have that they won't come back here and say, well, you know what? Now we need Oprah's on all these different buildings. They're 30 years old, they're obsolete, we need Oprah's. How is the parkland going to get cleaned up? It's unclear to me after looking at all this documentation whether the parkland would require a separate brownfield through them would it be cleaned up through the drain development project? Would it not be cleaned up at all? Uh, that's not very clear. Nothing I could find any way that spells it out. Do we have any guarantees that unlike the people who just bought the EDS property and apparently are turning around and reselling it, that they cannot resell or lease or rent or land contract or otherwise dispose of this property before the brownfield is up? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council at this time? Anyone else? Seeing no one. Um, at this time, uh, we first have a <coughs> on our agenda a correction to the resolution that was done on the Grossbeck golf course. And what I'd like to do is turn to the city attorney to explain to us uh, what changes need to be made. The um the resolution that was adopted was part of a transaction with the state to remove um, some of the, the restrictions on the charging of uh, different resident fees and non-resident fees. One of the pieces of the, of the um, description, there were two descriptions, had in it the, uh, the covenant not to charge. And uh, when, when uh, we, we received a, a uh, description, and it didn't exactly match, doesn't exactly match the description the state has. So this uh, resolution would correct 
the legal description to match the one that the state has for to allow this transaction to to occur and then it'll be just a matter of closing and the transfer of deeds and, and the uh, restriction would be removed are there any questions for the city attorney seeing none vice president spadafore Madam President, I move the resolution correcting resolution 2019-031 regarding Grossbeck Golf Course. We have a motion on the floor. Any questions? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Oppose. Passes. And it's my understanding this is on for a vote um, this evening on the agenda as well. Um, at this time, we are to the Memorandum of Understanding and the Ordinance Review on the Employee Retirement. Uh, is that, uh, are you going to handle this as well, Mr. Smirtka, or is there someone from? The chief will need to go through with 53 of He's in the back. Mr. Tate, if you'd please come forward at this time. Thank you, sir. If you take a seat at the uh, table and make sure that the green light is on, that way we'll be able to hear you. Madam President, is this okay? That's fine. Thank you, sir. And if you'd like to speak to the memorandum of understanding, and then we'll move forward. Thank you. So, uh, Madam President, I was directed by Mayor Shore to negotiate a memorandum of understanding with uh, Teamsters 243 Soup. In particular, <clears throat> the purpose of the mem memorandum was to allow individuals that came over from UAW to Teamsters 243 to use their time not uh, towards the, uh, the amount of pension that they were to receive, but simply to allow them to use the time that they had with UAW for Teamsters 243, so they could be, uh, if they met the requirement, 25 years or uh, any other requirement, they could use that time in order to retire. Okay, and that memorandum has been negotiated um, with the union and has been signed as well as with the administration, is that correct? That's correct, Madam President. Is there any action that's required from council to, uh, with this memorandum, do we need to um, also accept it or? Uh, Not at this time, Madam President. And I believe that the, uh, the only thing that needs to be done is the city will need to negotiate it and make sure that it's in the new CBA. Okay. At which point it will then become part of that successor agreement. All right, thank you. In your packet is the ordinance, um, introduction of the ordinance. Um, if you remember part of what we had to do, um, was to wait for the memorandum of understanding before we could move um, forward. In the ordinance, there is a blank space commencing. And um, Mr. City Attorney, what date do we need to fill in? Did you have a date in the MOU? Yes, one moment, please. I believe the date is March 15th, yeah, 2019. That's, that's correct, Madam President. I, I'm looking at the memorandum. Uh, yes, um, Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so it's going to be signed commencing on March 15th. So that's going to cover people who are existing in. You know, we had a, a particular person who came up here who, who had this issue. He will be covered under this with that date. We don't have to backdate it anymore than March 15th. If you read the rest of it, it says current employees who between October 29th, 1990 okay. and between September 30th, 2003 transferred. So that would cover. Good. Thank you. And if I might indicate, it is March 15th, commencing March 15th. So March 15th. 2019. Okay, 2019. 
uh, Council Member Jackson. I guess I just want to see, is this the action that was requested for the one or two, possibly three individuals? So this ordinance amendment would still only cover them? Yes. Okay. Are there other questions? So what we would need to do is to have a motion to set a public hearing for um, April 8th and then it is my understanding we would also look at passage on April 8th and that the um, employees retirement system is holding a special meeting council member Washington can you tell me when that is so then there will be a special um, employees retirement board on the 11th to approve his retirement. Are there any other council member um, Spitzley? All right, so we're moving the resolution to set the public hearing for um, April 8th. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Was no, yours? I'm a, not okay. I'm not okay. I was going to say, <laughs> uh, <laughs> excuse me, um, this is a late item, so uh, we will have to um, enter this as a late item uh, this evening uh, to set the public hearing. So that moves us to um, the Red Cedar. So um, in your packet, you should have the development agreement. Thank you, and we'll get to you later on when we get to closed session. Thank you, so, Madam Thank you. Um, so we have the um, information um, here, and who, um, <coughs> Mr. City Attorney is gonna go over the changes. So uh, you should also have a memo on this effect dated February 26, but the purchase price in this uh, seventh uh, amendment and the sixth one has already been signed. <clears throat> the purchase price has increased to 20, uh, $21,670 <clears throat> recognized in uh, delay in the closing. The, the signal to close date is moved to July 31st, 2019. Closing must still happen within 30 days of that date, so August 30th at the latest. There are several changes to the physical layout of the project. The developer is uh, removing one of the uh, two remaining plinths called the IPS. The project now has two uh, hotels, a full and uh, service and select service hotel. They are going to be housed in the same structure instead of two separate structures. The total square footage of the restaurant and the uh, retail is reduced from 40,000 to 35,550. The number of market rate units is reduced from 200 to 150. The separate structure for market rate active senior housing is eliminated entirely. It had proposed 98 units. Student housing is now located on the main section of the development instead of being right next to MSU. Uh, the area not visible uh, from Michigan Avenue is now all parking. Student housing will be in three buildings instead of one or two and the number of beds is reduced from 1,222 to 1,100. And the assisted uh, living senior housing component is increased from 116 to 120 units. The single IPS is now contemplated to be partially owned by the city only to the extent that parts will be freely open to the public. This will be subject to public services uh, letter of intent pro uh, process where a developer constructs and then um, dedicates uh, to our standards. Um, and so um, what will be public will uh, reflect uh, items that are typically public as far as the public service department is correct. So the bonding section was amended to clarify that the developer is the only one doing the bonding and not the city. 
Um, all parties agreed to the change, regardless of all amendments, uh, and so therefore that is, that is a major change also. The cap on developers' tax exempt bonding uh, form, uh, uh, what it is at 10 million, is now set at whatever amount ultimately qualifies as tax exempt bonds by the Lansing Building, uh, Lansing Brownfield Redevelopment Authority. And again, there is no, still no city uh, bonding. Uh, there were changes to the fiscal year um, and basically uh, some changes to the exhibit to show the components of the project and the project schedule, updated exhibits. And those are attached to the seventh uh, amendment, which is on file. The way I would like to go through this is if we could go through it page by page and if you have um, questions, we will see that they have been um, blue, red, whatever you want to call it, um, lined in the document. We're on page two. If you have questions at that time, please um, raise your hands so that you can be recognized. Uh, the first is the purchase price went from $2,200,000 to $2,221,670. Are there any questions? Seeing none, our next amendment is on page four, and um, that this is that the closing and the conveyance of the purchase uh, property, this is in 2.1, is contemplated um, shall occur within 30 days following the satisfaction of the waiver. There are any which would be um, by November 30th, 2018, where the date changes. Any questions? <coughs> All right. That takes us to page um, eight, and that is um, P. And again, this is a date change from May to September. All right. Next is um, page 10. This is the development obligations. This is um, that uh, in number A, not less than, it says 130, which is increased to 152. Next is the full service um, and select service um, hotel that will contain not less than 128 guest rooms. This is, and you can see what's been struck, struck, and stricken stricken um, at that point. Any questions? Next is the um, restaurant and inline retail, which went from 40,000 square feet to 35,550 square feet. Yes. Uh, council member when we, when we set the public hearing we actually had the development team in and this public hearing for the brownfield uh, and they explained that and this was also uh, part of the explanation at uh, both councilman Jer uh, garza sorry uh, constituent contact meeting as well as mine that the square footage for the commercial and, and retail space was actually going to be increased by five thousand but part of this uh, development agreement it says that it's actually going to be reduced um, to be not less than 35,550 square feet. So I'm just wondering, I know we do have the development team uh, here. I'm, I don't know if somebody can speak to, to where the confusion is. Would someone lies. like to, could you come up so you can answer any questions we might have? And my council members have said no pictures, no. PowerPoints, no, just answering our questions. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can shed some okay. light on Okay, that. thank you. So in the hotel space itself, there is a, what's called a kind of a, a common uh, retail. It's available to the public. 
it is assessed differently. Um, so we are in that 45,000 square foot total uh, amount. However, it is confusing, so we wanted to make sure that it was very clear that the 35,550 is separate and distinct outside of the hotel. Um, and Jason, did you want to add to that? And is that an accurate way to? Okay. So we, we have, when we met with the assessor to uh, project taxable value, um, we actually separated out that square footage. It is a completely distinct area. So. Okay, next goes to the market rate housing. You can see the changes. I'm not gonna, uh, Council Member Spadafore. I have a question, and maybe they can answer this. So in the original language, it guaranteed um, some level of, some number of one bedroom and two unit two bedroom units, why is there not the same type of guarantee in this revised value engineered proposal? Sure, it's, it is premature for us to identify actual square footage and number ones, twos, and threes uh, in those particular. We had to make a projection for taxable value purposes, so that is uh, on record with the assessor as a projection, but those units haven't been specifically designed uh, yet, and so when we get into the building plans, those will be uh, uh, identified uh, more accurately um, we are aiming toward those numbers that we had shared with you, um, but ultimately the, the, that decision, it's too premature for us to be locked down on, on anything until a building's designed. Then why were they in the original development agreement? Why were we led to believe that that was possible? I think they were extracted out of the numbers that we were using uh, for projected taxable value purposes. I, I can't answer that directly why, but uh, that would be my, I would surmise. Okay, well, this is the sixth version, and this is the first one that's taken that out. Um, before I ask Council Member um, Spitzley, can you tell us what the number was that you've given to the Treasurer's Office or the Assessor's Office? Yep, if you um, want to go on, we can sure. come back to it. I'll fire my computer up and I can tell you that. All right, thank you. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. <clears throat> what they gave numbers to the Assessor for taxable value. Oh, value, not the number of units? Yes. Okay. Councilmember Spitz. Thank you, Madam President. I mean, it just, I just feel that, you know, it, it, we're at the, we're, we're kind of at the 11th hour here. We've gone through six iterations and now we're here, you know, we're at the, we're at the, the seventh amendment, you know, we're, the, you know, the chimes are, are, are ringing here and now there's all, there's, there's a change in the language. So we've, we've gone along here thinking, you know, one thing, and now at the last minute there's a change. That, that, that concerns me. And, and you're going to go to the next one, so then I'll just get it all out so I don't yep, have to say right it again. Ahead. But this active senior um, multifamily housing omission is very, very, very troubling to me. I mean, it is extremely troubling to me. I, I think, again... Um, I'm not going to say bait and switch, I think I just said it, but it is extremely troubling to me that this was in there, you know, up until the 11th hour, and again, the chimes are ringing, and now, you know, we've got changes in market rate housing, we've got changes in, and we've, and we've reduced and eliminated the active senior multifamily housing, so I will just throw that out, that that is a huge concern of mine. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Councilmember Spadafore. I guess while they're up here, since we've, the full service, select service hotel issue is still confusing me, and I'm sorry I'm not looking at it, I'm trying to read the, the text. But I'm looking at a five story full service hotel and a select service hotel with no height restrictions and within the same structure. Explain one more time how it works that you've got two hotels in a five story structure and what guarant what height is that? If there, I, I think you've explained it as sort of a common lobby with two towers. Yeah, there's shared amenities sure. with a common lobby, like you're, you mentioned, but then there's separate structures for the individual hotels. So the actual rooms and things, those are independent of each other. So you'll walk into a common lobby, there'll be shared ballroom space, shared office space, shared pools, shared workout facilities, that type of thing. So for, for the most part, uh, um, you know, you'll still, if you walk into the, the select service brand, you're going into their check-in location and using their towers 
their elevator towers to get to your room and vice versa with the full service as well. And where's the um, guaranteed height of the select service hotel? Is this a two-story motor lodge or are we talking a five-story? No, no, it's all four, five-story. Every structure on the site will be five-story. Should that be in the a development agreement then? Yeah, I think if you look at exhibit well, C2. Well, uh, student housing's four stories, right? On C2. It's exhibit C2. Yeah, exhibit C2. Is, it's not in the development agreement. It's, it it's in the final it's exhibit. Part of the exhibit. It's, it's part of the exhibits. It's an exhibit, though. It's saying that you need to use a specific language. Can you put it? I don't mean to be difficult, but we've had seven revisions on this. Can you put your mic on and then raise your hand? Sorry. Go, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Madam President. I, I, I mean, I, I agree with <laughs> Councilman Spatterfor. I don't want it to be in an exhibit. I want it to have specific language in the development agreement. Um, I mean, I think we've we've had an issue with this just recently with uh, a police substation on another issue that it was on a zoning thing. It was mentioned in some minutes, but it wasn't exactly in the development agreement, and we we have some problems. And so I think we need to have that language um, specifically put in the agreement and not as an exhibit. Thank you. And I would turn to the city attorney on that. We'll have to amend the language with them. It won't be a material change, so it wouldn't uh, cause any delay. Okay, thank you. Did you re find your information? Eric, okay. I, I did. Um, so just so I'm clear in giving you what you want, uh, you wanted the multifamily? Is that what you wanted or the student housing? The multifamily. The multifamily. So its predominance is split almost equally between studios and one bedrooms. Um, we've identified nine two bedrooms. So there was 150 units. So um, you can, it's mainly studios and one bedrooms. So we've gone from. Uh, this is on the multifamily only. Yes, okay. Council Member Spadafore. So in the original six versions, we saw 55 one bedrooms and 115 two bedrooms. So now you're telling me there's nine two bedrooms and mostly studios and one bedroom apartments for families that, to live in? It is mostly ones and uh, ones and studios, that is correct. Jason, Jason, do you need to add anything? Well, the intent is not to be student housing. So that, that the idea is to go to, um, you know the professors or grad students or active seniors, whoever. It's a it's a broader market that you, is brought to the. You don't think a studio apartment within throw stone a stone's throw of campus is appealing to a student market? Well, I think you have to recognize that you know we have partner developers on this. Um, they're very sensitive to make sure that they're not taking from one market or the other. So we have student housing that's specific to student housing members, and then the market rate would be independent or separate from those folks. Those are whole separate developers, so they do not want to compete with each other. Cannibalism. It, cannibalism, effectively. You've got more developers at the table than the ones we've met? The, well, there's partner developers, so there's hotels, there's restaurants. Those, we, we refer to those as developers. Those are partner developers. People paying the rent, got it. Council Member Spitzley. And, and those partner developers are going to be doing one bedroom and studio apartments? In that particular building, there is a developer that is independent of the student housing. And we have not met that person? I don't believe that. You've met, you've met Frank. I mean, he's a partner in all of those develop, developments, and Joel. So there's a, a conglomerate of part, uh, partner developers. Each one is specific or a, an expert in their field. So we have an expert student housing group that we will partner with as a development team to help make sure the project's a successful one. And then the same thing with the, the hotel components and, and the assisted living. I mean, we work with these people all over the country. I appreciate that. I, I, I appreciate that. So who's your um, partner for um, your one bedroom and studio apartments? That, that hasn't been finalized yet. We, we, we're talking to a few different folks. Are you talking to folks who do two-bedroom apartments as well? Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember Washington and then Councilmember Jackson. Thank you, Madam President. I've got a couple things here. 
Um, I, too, am a little disturbed at the very few two-bedroom apartments. Um, I did hear from one of my constituents who is an incredible landlord on the east side, and he's concerned with just the student housing with it taking away from um, landlords that, that rent on the east side to students. A and I think that's a valid concern. And But I also thought there would be more two bedrooms, but I'm afraid I have to agree with my colleague, um, Councilman Spadafore, that I think you're gonna get students in the studio in the one bedrooms. The flip side of this is I did talk to another developer who, who does downtown developments, and he said he, the one bedrooms go quicker than anything. And, and so I'm, I'm really torn here. But I think what I am not torn about is it seems like we've been getting a whole lot of, what's that term you won't use? Bait and switch lately. Not just with this, we, we got it on the west side, we've gotten it with EDS, we've gotten it, it seems to be coming at us all the time, and, I, and I'm sorry that I have to look at everything with such a critical eye now, and with such suspicion, but I, I'm really disturbed that there are only nine two-bedroom units. You know, that can yeah. certainly change. Uh, again, these were projections based on what we were being told, uh, based on the reduction from 200 to 150 uh, market rate apartments and what the market is showing. You make a very good point about the market. Um, they're reacting to the market, and that's why you see a predominance of uh, one bedrooms and studios in this. Um, also, just kind of a general point, these are minimums that are in the agreement. Um, so, you know, they certainly, the, you know, we're being held to a, a minimum standard with these product types that are here. Um, so there certainly could be a change for, for an increase, but that would be dealt with in the site plan approval process and really has no bearing here. It also would only help uh, the Brownfield. Uh, you know, and I, I know this is something we talked with, with Leaf and, and Bob and, and Carl. You know, the more product that they can build, the better this Brownfield plan is going to look and the better it's going to pay off in the shorter years that it will be there. So um, everybody's very cognizant of that, and, and the more taxable value they can bring on, more product that they can build, the better. Council, were you done, Councilman uh, Just real quick, Eric. The thing is, you know, we all know by 2030, the seniors are going to far outweigh the number of millennials or anybody else. So I think we have to be proactive and look at the market that's going to be here in just a few short years. Now, I will tell you, if I were deciding to downsize, I would certainly want to be in the Red Cedar Project or Stadium or something, but I'd want two bedrooms. So I think we cannot forget the market that's going to be here in just a few short years. Councilman, did you have a comment to that? I'm sorry, you're waiting. Was up. there any comment? Uh, no, we'll we'll okay. go back to our partner developer okay. and look at the re and review the product mix. Okay. And uh, you know, if it's certainly if we can improve on it, I think Eric touched on the the more taxable revenue is the better for the project. Yes. So uh, obviously we can we can discuss it with them and and okay. see what we can do. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. Thank you, uh, and you kind of alluded to it on the last answer, but what are some of the factors and considerations or determinations that would cause all these changes? Because um, it seems like, you know, the project's been at least contemplated for years, and then if you talk about building, you can only, you know, you gotta do some engineering with that. So you, you mentioned market, Is there, are there anything else that makes these happen now? Yeah, so we're each, uh, every time we come to, into a development, we ha have a market study for that use. Um, I know we're in the process of doing a few of those right now just to confirm that what we're expecting to be projected uh, will work. Um, and again, because of that, when you start comparing the infrastructure cost, uh, obviously we're looking at the tax revenue and working with the assessor to see how we can make the project actually, actually function and work. So. Um, I think we're comfortable with where we are and those uses, um, and our individual developers, our partner developers, are also confident in where we are, and that's why we're here today to try to push this forward. 
and confident basically with this version and the minimums that's in place. That's correct. I think before I call on Councilmember uh, Spadafore and Spitzley, I think to also answer your question, Councilmember Jackson, is when we started um, this discussion, there was the potential for the city to have bonded $38 million. And part of the reiterations of these plans have been the reduction of the city having to bond and more of that responsibility being put on the developer to where we are today, which is no bonding um, through the city. And I think that's where some of these changes have come into um, effect with those. So Council Member um, Spadafore and Council Member Spitzley. I appreciate the answer and you'll get back to us on some of these things because I have understand that they're minimums, but we're sitting here wanting to make sure that the minimums are truly what we want to see at that site. We've been talking about game changing, you know, for this space connecting MSU and the city. Um, and every time we come back, it seems a little bit smaller, a little bit more. I think the term you all use is value engineered. We want to make sure the minimums we're approving are something that actually is a game changer for that area. Otherwise, it's just Eastwood in a swamp. And we want to make sure we're looking at something that's truly meaningful for that area. And I understand you've got a lot in this and a lot of partners, a lot of moving parts. But this is our deliberation time. And I appreciate that you're willing to take a look at some of the concerns that have been raised today. Councilmember um, Spitzley and then Councilmember Dunbar. Um, I, I also appreciate you guys coming here. I mean, it can't be easy for you to be up there and having us throw out questions and comments. And, but, you know, the development agreement um, is, is an important mechanism for us. It's an important mechanism that keeps us to our agreements and our commitments, but it also keeps you to your commitments. And so, you know, while it may appear that we're nitpicking language, um, you know, I, I go back to the phrase, when I'm in Myers and one of my constituents comes up to me and asks me, well, why didn't you ask the tough questions? I need to be able to say, well, I did ask the tough questions. I did hold them to hold their feet to the fire. And so, you know, I, I, I am going to continue to ask the tough questions because I think it's important. I, I would like this to be a game changer, too. And I, and I think it has the potential to be so. Um, but I also want to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're getting what we think we're getting. And um, I, 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 I do commend the fact that we were at $38 million in bonding and now we're down to zero. Um, I, I, and, I, and I appreciate your hard work on that. Um, uh, but um, I, I, unfortunately, I'm kind of a what have you done for me lately kind of person when it comes for the, to this. And so I'm looking at, um, for example, you know, the, uh, sep by September 1, 2018, so I did all that nice stuff to ask you a really tough question, so I hope, I hope you got buttered up, but September 1, 2018, the developer shall prepare and provide to the city an economic impact study. So that economic impact study, did that talk about, at the time, did it talk about, you know, the, the market rate housing, you know, in the number and what did sell and what didn't and whether or not you know, it was the market, the market would support active, you know, senior, um, you know, so it, and if it did, I'm just kind of wondering what changed between September 1 and then this and version number 7. So just to be clear, the, the market study that was referred to is separate and distinct from the economic impact study that's identified in the agreement. Um, the market studies that um, Jason Hextock was referring to are conducted uh, by the, the independent product types uh, to determine what is going to be, you know, saleable or, or you know, rentable and so forth. Uh, the economic impact study is an impact on Lansing residents. What will this development do to the economy uh, and to, to Lansing residents? So they are, they are separate. I'll, I'll let I'm sorry, but doesn't doesn't that economic impact study doesn't that talk about housing and and if you're bringing in X number of people that are going to live in that area, they're going to contribute X amount of taxes, yes. X amount of shopping. So it does have to take into a certain component of housing when you're doing the economic impact study. Is that correct? It, it does. You are correct. Definitely correct on that. Um, what it doesn't do is identify what the market will bear. It'll basically say. 
we, are, we provided them our numbers. And what they do is they take our numbers. We are gonna, we're gonna build so many apartments. We're building so much in student housing and so forth, and a number of hotels based on the occupancies that were projected uh, in those taxable value uh, evaluations. They take that information and then that's how they, they, they base it. So they were using data that, that we pro were provided by our product types in turn to output uh, that Lansing impact. Uh, Councilmember Dunbar, then Councilmember Hussein. I'm, I'm, I was happy to hear um, Councilmember Wood mention that when we stepped away, um, when you allowed us to step away to make this feasible, and we no longer carry the burden um, of financial, hard, hard and financial numbers in the game by bonding, we, we hand over to you all of the risk in that regard. Um, <clears throat> and I wonder if you could speak a bit, because what's going through my mind right now is I'm, I'm thinking there's a lot of things I want in this project, but I'm not funding it. Um, I want a two bedroom, I'd love to live in there. But I'm thinking at the same time that I'm saying that is that I can get probably a one bedroom and a studio out of the same footprint of that two bedroom and have more rent come in if the demand supplies that. And that your lenders, um, when making the numbers work on this, um, you know, I, I, I heard the comment earlier, like how much profit is enough and can we, can we trim the profit um, from from the developers end, but there's also the profit that is necessary in order to make this work on the books. And how much of that goes into you determining what products are available given the footprint that you have with your reduced size of development? Um, is demand for what's needed, even if there's demand for what needed, it, does that affect what the economy can actually support there? Like, do you have to choose which demands you meet in order to make the thing financially feasible? And could you speak a little bit about that? That's a loaded question. I know, <laughs> and I'm sick, and I'm and, sorry. And I sound like no, I got no, my Catherine Hepper on, but. Um, I'll, try to, uh, I'll try to make it as a summary, and if okay. I'm not answering your question, please follow sure. up with another question. Um, the answer is yes, we do look at the product types and what they're going to generate. Um, so when we had to resize this, we, we resized this several times as you had stated, um, we, we have to first off look at what will sell, what, what will the market bear, what will work. Um, we look at that separately from the brownfield, uh, and the brownfield's needed to build the infrastructure, okay, the 54 million that we keep talking about. Um, so then after we know we have a saleable product and we have a product that can be built, we then take those numbers and project, do we have a, enough taxes, tax revenue, to generate from these products in order to uh, be able to build the infrastructure necessary to allow that wonderful vertical piece? And there have been several iterations that we've had to do because the numbers didn't make sense. Um, that you saw that the first time when we went from three IPSs down to one. And that's why we went down, down to one IPS. Um, but because we shaved so much cost, in the last iteration, it was nearly 90 million down to 54 million. Because we were able to shave the cost down and go to a larger single IPS, and yes, we did lose some product types while we did that, um, it made the project feasible. So it was, a, it was a difference of having a project and not having a project. Um, and and that's, that's how we resolved the, the problem of the infrastructure cost. So I don't know if I, that's kind of a big picture answer. Um. It is a bit, it, it gets to my, I, to my point. I don't know if it, if it got to anybody else's questions up here. Um, but the other question that I would have, and this is about the student housing and the efficiencies versus one bedrooms and the competition. It's been my experience in um, apartments that cater to students, like a two and three bedroom apartment with a common area. Those are really high rent. They're almost charged what we would charge for a one bedroom for an individual student to have one room and share space. It's a completely different marketing model 
do you have any information about how those units will be constructed and priced versus what the market rate would be? Because, I mean, if it was me, <clears throat> I mean, understanding what my colleagues are saying, I might choose to go into a market rate studio rather than deal with three roommates in a four bedroom apartment that costs me the same amount of money. So can you talk to those price structures at all? So I, I'll try to give an answer to it. Um, I, I, don't, I can't get into the weeds on, on their, their business model, but it is on a per bed basis. So when you look at the rent, for example, on a five bedroom, five bath unit, um, and there's this dollar amount that's there, generally speaking, they're paying less per bed than they would be if they had to incur the entire cost of an apartment themselves. That's why they often will locate in these student housing product types. Um, that's how it's been explained to me. I'm not the expert in the field, but based on the models that, that I've reviewed and, and done, that's what I, I routinely see. I don't know if you want to add to that. That was accurate. You and said I, that was accurate. <laughs> and I also believe that in the student housing, they sign a 12-month lease, but they're only really here for school for nine months. And each bedroom has its own bath. So four bedrooms, four bath with a common area, which would be, like you said, a different model in terms of the studios or the one bedrooms or even two bedrooms. Okay, Council Member Hussein. I was, I was far back, <laughs> and, and I should say I was far enough back in line where most of my questions were answered. Um, I would just reiterate some of the concern um, that I've heard up here. When we approved this, um, the, the development agreement back in July uh, 2018, this was, uh, which also included zero municipal bonding, uh, by the way, um, it, was, it was painted as, or I should say conveyed through this, was this multi-generational um, development. And, and now what we see when you consider this multi-generational spectrum, really what I'm seeing here with the elimination of what I believe to be the multifamily component as well as the active senior, um, you have a whole lot of housing for uh, student and, and also housing that will be um, attractive and appealing to student uh, groups. And then very few uh, of the, you know, obviously the assisted living piece. So I, I almost feel like we've done away with this multi-generation, multi-generational component that we talked so much about. Um, so I just want to reiterate some of the concern I heard. In terms of your process, I guess I'm confused on one piece. When you when you talk about the different development types and you talk about or the different product types and you talk about um, uh, what the market can bear in that particular area, you said that you worked with. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you worked with your partner developers, correct? But then when we asked why we had not seen the market rate housing partner here, you said that hadn't been finalized. So who did you work with? Or maybe, I'm, maybe I confused yeah. you. No, 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 you didn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very perceptive of you. Um, so when we move forward with the project, ultimately there will be one, uh, but they are talking to a couple of different ones. So I would have to say the information I received was from a lead company. Is that fair to say? Okay. So Jason, Jason represents the, the development side, so I need to make sure. So um, could, and they just don't want to be able to say that name yet because they haven't finalized uh, their, their agreement or their contract. Um, so we have been dealing with the lead partner developers, um, but until a deal is inked, obviously it could change. Is that similar to retail space and things like that, that exactly. you're, yep. you know, yeah. or the hotel brand or any of those things that and I would also add that the multi-generational piece would fit perfectly with the multi-family. It's no different. Councilmember Hussein. And just, and just, you know, and I appreciate the anecdote that Councilman Washington provided, but um, in terms of one bedrooms and, and maybe a few two bedrooms um, downtown, the market downtown, the proximity to downtown, downtown makes downtown, sorry, makes that market completely different. And I think. Councilman Spadafor spoke to the fact that the proximity to uh, Michigan State makes this market different. And so I think those one bedroom, uh, in terms of the multifamily, uh, will certainly uh, be more attractive and appealing to stud uh, students. So when we're moving from mostly two bedrooms in the past uh, development agreement to almost all studios and one bedrooms, that, that still is concerning to me, okay. certainly. Okay, any more questions on this section? That would take us to page 11. And that takes us into the senior village. And some of, I know those were some concerns and questions. Council Member Spadafore. It's just back. Earlier, it was mentioned that all the buildings will be four stories. And this now has limited to two, minimum of two stories. So there's just some inconsistencies in what 
what's being said and what's actually in this agreement. I want that on the record that this is now a two-story building minimum instead of a minimum four-story building. And in the in the exhibit, it says two to four, but again, a discrepancy. Any comment? We're looking at section H. Okay. I can add something. Uh, okay. So the two to four, the reason there's a range, there's there's a, a memory care facility and then the assisted living piece. So that that is at a lower level. So it's a separate, distinct area. So it's not two or four. There's there's two different levels in in that particular building. I see what you're referring to now. So I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood originally. That makes sense. Thank and you. The, and that's solely because of um, fire codes and restrictions that are associated sure. with memory care. That makes sense. I appreciate the clarification. Okay. Yeah. Right. Seeing no other concerns, then we go down to um, J, which talks about um, construction uh, that may be um, publicly owned. And again, I think we're talking about streets, sewers, sidewalks. Council Member Spadafore. Well, um, Madam President, this is actually specifically in the construction of the integrated parking structure. So um, I want to just clarify, I understand yes, it, public, it, I, public roads would be obviously publicly owned, but in the statement it says, they will be constructed and maintained exclusively, exclusively by the developer, but maybe partially publicly owned. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, maybe you can explain what kind of obligations we can look forward to on, a, on this. Uh, That's to be determined based upon bonding uh, that hasn't been decided specifically yet, but there would be a maintenance agreement also. So a maintenance agreement would, uh, like ongoing maintenance, so in 30 years we're not going to be having a conversation about an aging parking structure that needs to be bonded for with city resources. It's contemplated that when the uh, uh, dedicated portion comes to the city, there'd be a corresponding maintenance agreement with the developer. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? It, it, I think it tried to, but we can talk offline. Okay, that takes us to page 13. And we're on uh, 5.6. And this is the section on the sidewalks. I was ahead of myself. The sidewalks and the sewers and the um, streets. Any questions on that? Then it's... Um, the relocation of existing businesses. Any question on that? Then we're down to 5.9. Um, talks about the prevailing wage. Council Member Spadafore. I'm skipping ahead, but it's the same section. Is that all right? Pardon? I'm skipping to the next page, but it's the same section. Yes. Okay. Um, so through this agreement, it now asserts, notwithstanding anything in the local labor agreement to the contract, nothing in the local labor agreement shall be interpreted to require the developer to withhold pay or be responsible for city income tax for or on behalf of the general contractor, construction manager, or subcontractors. Hold on. Okay. It does require the contractors to contractually comply with that. Okay. That, that makes sense. Thank you're, you. You're all right? Yeah. Okay. Anything, any other questions on that section? That takes us to page 16. And that is section A. It's, there's a one change in um, 7.3 which um, was the state of Michigan and the, and the city was taken out and developer put in. Section A um, talks about um, the tax exempt bonds. Any question on that? Seeing none, we're to page 17. And we're down on D and E. This is changing the terminology of GO bonds to um, TE bonds. Okay. 
Those are old ones. Okay. So, so the changes that are in this Okay. So the changes that you see on um, the top part of 18 were changes that were originally made. Now we're down to 7.4, which is other incentives. And you'll see that there's a date change from October 1st, 2018 to September 30th, 2019. Any questions on that? Seeing none. Patricia, oh, Council Member Spitzley. Thank sorry. you, Madam President, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the last um, sentence, any other financial incentives as developer may request and the city may support shall be in their sole discretion. I'm assuming that's kind of matching funds if, if, if needed, or what, is that, what does that last sentence mean? No, so it's just generally, sometimes the state, especially the MEDC, will require some additional supportive information um, you know, right now we're just talking about CRP here, but if there's another particular <coughs> program, so we're, we're not looking at anything like matching funds. So you don't the anticipate city. the city putting up any matching no, fund dollars? No, none, zero, zero. Okay, dollars. all right, thank you. All right, and as I see it, that's the last change that we had in the agreement. Are there other questions for uh, Mr. City Attorney? There was a question raised about whether the agreement is assignable and the, it, it is with a consent of the city. Right. What was that? Could. Assignable. Consent of the city. Could you put your mic on such that. It is assignable with the consent of the city. Okay. Are there other council member uh, Washington? Just really quickly. Um, Chris and Eric, there's something just in my gut. $54 million brownfield. This area must be developed. I get it. I totally get it. But I am so disturbed that we've come down to student housing in a nursing home. This really, really disturbs me. And I just, I've got some time to mull it over, and I know I'm going to see you all on the 6th, and I can ask you more questions. But from going to this multi-generational to, and you know the one bedrooms are gonna be grad students. It's, it's going to be students and a nursing home. And I'm really having a hard time digesting that because we have 14 stories going up in East Lansing, I think two of them. They've got a hotel coming. They, at, you know, college admissions are down. And I just, I'm just really, really struggling with this. You don't have to answer me now. Like I said, I'll see you on the 6th. But I just want you to know that there, there are some things that I'm really struggling with, even though I know this property must be developed. We have to have that gateway. But a nursing home and student housing, that's, that's a lot of money for us to put forward for that. So I'm just saying, thanks. Uh, Council Member um, Hussein. I, I agree, you know, and, and I was concerned that we might uh, arrive at this point. Uh, Mr. Cass is, is actually on record. Um, I don't have my computer in front of me, but I actually read this in, our, in an article. That, you know, he was, you know, unequivocally said that what lured him to this, to this site was the opportunity to do student housing. And it feels like um, we've done whatever we can to, to get back to that uh, primarily student housing. So I'm concerned about that. With that being said, um, can you, for the public, um, kind of lay down the timeline in terms of public hearing, when this will be referred back to committee, when, when this is up for final approval, just so they know um, how much time they have essentially to digest and, and to uh, make sure that they provide comment to, to council? My understanding of the timeline is that we would be setting the public hearing for the development agreement tonight to have on for 
um, April 8th. And then that would go back to Committee of a Whole and then be up for passage on the 22nd. And then you have um, the brownfield that is also um, coming up on that uh, as well. So, um, yes, Christopher. I did want to point out one of the changes were a reduction of 122 student housing beds. They didn't get larger, it got smaller. Um, I, I get that, but the active senior totally went away, and we went to one bedrooms and studios. I, I'm really, really concerned about this because what we ended up with was in the multifamily, which is nothing about family, um, we ended up with more student housing apartments, and, and I'm struggling with this, students and senior citizens, and we've hit that student housing bubble. We've hit it. <coughs> Council Member Spitzley. And Thank you, Madam Council President. Dunbar. You know, when, when this uh, um, development was first proposed, it reminded me kind of, and I don't, because I travel, I always, it's, it's a place in Ohio called Crocker Park, and it had, you know, retail, and it had, you know, um, multifamily housing, active housing, and I, and I saw how successful that was there, and I'm really excited about it. I am gonna agree with my colleague at this point, I mean, you, you, in the development agreement, you, you reduce the number of student housing, but that's just nomenclature. You know, to me, you know, a, a studio apartment is, is, is for um, a college student. My son lives in a studio apartment. And, you know, and I, as, an, as, as a woman of a certain age, um, looking to age in place would not move into a studio apartment, nor would I move into a one-bedroom apartment. So you kind of, in my mind, you have, you have reduced the, the options to I'm either in a senior citizen's assistant living home or I'm living in a studio apartment with a bunch of grad students. And so as we look at transforming our community, but also, rec you know, and attracting young people, but also recognizing that there are people who want to age in place, we have left out the people who want to age in place in this redevelopment and in, and in its development. And, and um, it, it is, it is a, um, a concern for me. I also recognize that we, you know, it's gonna be developed. I, I get that. Um, but I am, again, I would be remiss if I didn't um, express the concerns that I'm hearing from my constituents, and that's a big concern. You know, how much student housing is too much? And then if you, you know, you're dressing up the one bedroom in the studios as multifamily housing, I, I, just, I, I, I just don't see it. And so, um, again, you know, I, I appreciate you guys coming down here and, and, and talking to us about the changes, but that, 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 uh, that concerns me as well. Thank you, Madam President. Can I add one thing to, to the comments? I, I, yes. Good points, and um, we, we talked about it last time, but I, I know there's a lot of details. The first phase of the student housing is 600 beds. They split, another part of the change is that we split it into two separate distinct construction periods. So if it's determined that that particular product type, the student housing, the 600 beds, is sufficient, you've got a 500 bed piece that then will be developed into something else. Um, but we're very cognizant of the comments about saturation in the market, and you know, so one of the things that you saw was, was the reduction. I know it wasn't a, a great number, but it was 122. Um, but by splitting it into two phases also is, is in recognition of that. Um, I, I know it's not speaking to the 55 and older product piece, but I just wanted to remind people about the split and the phases. Council Member Dunbar, then Council Member Spadafore. Okay, so <clears throat> what was your original definition of family in the concept of multifamily? Because that this, this really would lead me to the crux of what everyone up here is concerned about, that what you have is multi-unit, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily multifamily. I mean, I've got kids. I had kids when I lived in an apartment, but that was because I had a two bedroom and I had a room to put a kid in. Nobody's gonna have kids in a one bedroom apartment. CPS won't even allow you to do that. Like, I mean, there's, so it, couples are a family. Childless couples are a family. People who choose not to have children are a family. Um, 
retired couples and individuals or an individual or family but have children who'd want to come and visit. So my first question is, what were you thinking? What was your operational definition of family when we first started talking about this? Well, I'm not sure I'll specifically answer that. I think what we're, we bear out is what, uh, in the end, will be the market study. Uh, certainly, I've heard everybody's comments today um, about that, and I think we'll go back and look at this just to understand the mix and how that plays out. Um, all I can emphasize is that these are the minimums, and that for purposes of the working with the tax assessors where, where we tried to establish that. Um, it, it provides a more conservative approach to the Brownfield plan in that um, we're expecting less tax revenue and if that mix goes up, i.e. the two bedrooms count goes up, that only benefits the project. So I think from, from, from that respect, I certainly understand you and, <coughs> and hear where we need to reevaluate some things and, and uh, I think I'd like that opportunity to go back and, 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 and make sure that we're hitting the, uh, your concerns. And I, I, I completely sympathize with the market-driven nature of the footprint and having to maximize your, your revenue. <clears throat> but along the line of that, I appreciate you emphasizing that you split the student housing in half. I wish that the half that you'd built was still in that part hidden in the back by the actual Brody complex. Because I feel like you have, you're gonna build in this street front section and, and, and the cart may be, you know, the horse may be out of the door and, and it's no, there's nothing left to do about it. But if, if the contemplation is that the second phase of the project um, could change based on market demand, I would think that student housing being built where that parking lot is, even if it left a parking lot on Michigan Avenue in the meantime, <clears throat> would allow the addition of the multifamily, whatever you want to call it, housing, in a space that's segregated from the student housing. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure that that would be appropriate in the back by Brody Complex if that was the phase two and the additional family component was considered for that. I understand that the, the challenge with the southeast portion of the project is it, it's more in the floodplain, so that increased the cost of the project. So in a sense, there's a win-win there by uh, making the project more dense. We were able to save on cost and infrastructure cost specifically. So the, there, there lied the challenge. I mean, obviously, we, we certainly understand the benefits of being back there, but the expense was just too much to be able to make that project portion work with the overall infrastructure cost. Council Member Spadafore. Which raises my point. Phase two we keep talking about, but what was the cost of building on that site? I mean, you got 54 million in, in infrastructure now, it was 90 million total? That, off the top of my head, I want to say is around $18 million to go back there to the east, so if not more, maybe 19 million. And that's just to be able to build vertical above that. So the hypothetical phase two with multifamily units is in the same situation the whole property's in. Yeah, I, I would not anticipate a hypothetical multifamily project back there in the right. east. So and he's talking about phase two. Oh, and it, 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 it's just about phase two. I'm talking about the new parking lot on the river. Oh, in, in that part, uh, the phase two of student housing, we, what we've done is eliminated the IPS there, so that infrastructure cost went down. Um, what we're doing as part of this first phase is setting up for that, um, so then it would be just standard construction above and beyond what would be typical. So if it did switch. Right, so if it did switch, then that makes it more uh, viable from a cost standpoint. Okay, so, so it's, it's either, it doesn't matter what's built above it, I must have been confused because I think two weeks ago, whenever we last spoke, you mentioned to me that you're not making this ground buildable for higher elevation stuff where the parking lot is now that was supposed to be student housing. Rather, you've moved all the IPS inf infrastructure to the main site, which makes sense from a financial perspective. Correct. But to go back and build on the new parking lot on the river, you're going to have to dig down and build a, a substructure again? Yeah, no, no. So I think we're confusing fa phase two is not where student housing was where the parking is. That's not what we're calling phase two. Okay. Yeah, so that's the, that I just figured out where the, our breakdown was. That's where it is, okay. Fa exactly. Phase two is, um, is it, do you have the drawing in front of you? I'm looking right at it, so um, it's student F. housing is yeah. 
It's the U-shaped building that's D. F. So you, you know where the yeah. standalone restaurant is in the boulevard? Yes. Okay, if you to go immediately east. to the east of that, that U-shaped building. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so it's, it's a U-shaped building that's going to be, half of it's going to be developed now. Yeah, do you want to describe the student housing, the, the buildings on phase one versus phase two? Yeah, so phase one is the building along Michigan Avenue, and that would be constructed as part of the first phase. Oh, so, yes. and then as part of, part of phase one, what we would do is, is obviously get the infrastructure extended to that parcel, okay. i.e. the sanitary, the water, the storm, and then grade it out. Okay. And then ultimately when phase two develops, then that structure, and, and I'm saying when the phase two student housing develops, we would just have to come in, do foundations, and go vertical with whatever product. use is there or product. Uh, obviously in this scenario, we're anticipating student housing. So F is not happening right now yeah. yeah there's a there's a there is a year plus the ips uh d delay for construction and i can actually give you a date it was um in the powerpoint i can give that to you if you would like i you've um, clarified i was confused i was assuming i think i understood last week or two weeks ago excuse me i don't recall the date that the what used to be student housing in the original submission was going to be phase two and then everything on this compacted site was was no, sorry, we, can, we might have it's, confused it, you. I, I just might. I'm sorry. There's a lot of moving parts. I may have misunderstood. Don't apologize. Um, thank you for the clarification. Councilmember um, Hussein. Actually, I was just going to clarify um, that, that when they, they are talking about phase two, they're actually talking about the potential of uh, that, that F site on your map. I think the only reason why we uh, discussed that, that parking lot is I asked the question uh, that if this development does much better uh, than, than what we maybe anticipate from the outset, could they potentially build on that site? And they said yes. However, and that actually precipitated a question uh, from you, I believe, uh, about you know, them coming back before City Council for future economic incentives to actually create the public infrastructure necessarily, uh, or necessary to build at that site. So I was just going to try to clarify that. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions? I just have a, a couple real quick, and then what we'd be looking for is a motion to set the public hearing um, for April 8th. Um, we had um, some apartments that, with retail below that were promised um, on Michigan Avenue. And what ended up happening was um, a series of those apartments were turned in to um, offices and um, and not utilized as, as apartments. And part of the pro forma that we were given based on the brownfield and that was the fact that, you know, we would be collecting 1% um, income tax on that um, because we'd have people living there. Is there any guarantee that, that if apartments are not being utilized that you will not turn them into offices? It, I, I think, you know, obviously, again, it's, it's the, the logic of planning out the different phases of the project. Specifically, we've identified the student housing as a potential other product type in the future. Um, we anticipate this mixed-use building, the, the apartments and, and the first floor retail to develop in the first phase. Mm -hmm. So um, in the event that something happens with the apartments that aren't running well, I mean, obviously, I think we would explore other options for that structure. But uh, the intent or the first purpose of the development would be to get apartments in that structure. Yeah, that, that building is also not built on the IPS. So it is, it's the first building you will see. Is that still correct? Yeah. Yep. So that's the first that will be under construction. Uh, the Clifford and Michigan Avenue corner building is what we're referring to. Okay, thank you. So what we're looking for is a motion to set public hearing for um, April 8th. Do we have a motion on that? Um, Council Member Washington. I would move that we set the public hearing for the Red Cedar project for April 8th. All right, we have a motion on the table. Are there any other questions or concerns? Council Member Spadafore and then Council Member um, Spitzley. Maybe this is for the city attorney, but we've seen um, back and forth discussion about possible changes we may see in a revised agreement. So is it premature to set the hearing on an agreement that may change? 
Right now, the changes I've heard are not the addition of the language from the exhibit to the, it's not a major change, so I, okay. I don't think there's a need right now to reset the third degree, because you'd have to put it back on file for another 30 days, so. Okay, Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. I, I, I had the same um, concern, but, you know, again, stressing the importance of the development agreement and that the language and what, you know, and, and the agreements and the understandings between um, the developer and council be um, codified in this agreement, not in exhibits, not on attachments, but in, in, in the development agreement. That way there's no, you know, future misinterpretations or misunderstandings, but, you know, stuff that we're concerned about, such as the height of buildings and other things, be specifically put in the development agreement. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Um, passes unanimously, and we will be voting on this um, to set the public hearing at the council meeting um, this evening. Thank you. Um, that takes us into um, moving into closed session, and I would turn to Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, I move that the council move to closed session for the ratification of the Teamsters 214 Collective Bargaining Agreement. We have a motion. Are there um, this roll call? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> uh, so it's my understanding this was requested. It has to be requested by one of the parties, and the city is requesting this closed session. Is that okay. correct? It's my understanding the city's requested this, yes. Okay. Roll call vote. Councilmember Spadafore? Yes. Councilmember Spitzley? Yes. Councilmember Washington? Yes. Councilmember Hussein? Yes. Councilmember Jackson? Yes. Councilmember Dunbar? Yes. Councilmember Wood? Yes. At this time, we are uh, recessed. We will be back in session after um, we are done with closed session.
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I Bald spot on the camera. I'm on the what's the logo? Well, see from that angle, you'll be directly visible during public comment, and anybody else that comes up from the podium. I'll be hiding behind the city seal, I think. <laughs> Check it out. Let's see. Oh. <laughs>
Okay. We'd like to call to order um, back into session the uh, Committee of the Whole, um, Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, <coughs> I move the resolution ratifying the Teamsters 214 Collective Bargaining Agreement. Uh, we have a motion. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, and this will be on for passage this evening. Um, with that, I see no, no other. No. Oh, all right. I forgot. Thank you. Councilmember Washington. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, this is, I'm bringing this before my colleagues to make sure that everybody has buy-in and that everybody is accepting of this. For a couple years now, I have actually been trying to get a park named after Tony Benavides, our longtime community servant who has given so much to, to our community. I didn't realize that tonight there would be a, a tribute to him, but this is separate from that. Um, I went and talked to the mayor and um, because I would like to get this finished, and Brett Kaczynski, the head of park, said he would absolutely be happy to name a park after Mayor Benavides. However, Mayor Shore suggested, he said it's he said he had been thinking about it, and how did I feel about the city council chambers being named for Tony Benavides, which I thought was great. So what we did, we had a family member, um, because they're having some hard times right now, we had a family member approach the Benavides family, and they are asking that we choose having the city council chambers named after Mayor Benavides. What I would like to do is I would like to do a resolution that we can pass at our next council meeting, officially dedicating the um, chambers to Mayor Benavides. Mayor Shore has agreed to have the plaque made, and then it will be forever the Tony Benavides Lansing City Council Chambers. And I would like to know if you all would buy into that. Uh, Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I support it. The only thing I would ask is when's the next council meeting again? Is it April? It's on the 8th. On the 8th. Yeah. April 8th. Just wanted to make sure I'm here so I can yes. vote for it. But yes, I'm, right. I, I think it's wonderful. He's a great public servant and I'm definitely supportive. And, and I would add that I think that would be a little bit too soon to probably pull the whole thing together and we would have the actual formal dedication sh shortly thereafter, but not that night. Okay. Are there other questions or concerns? So seeing none, what we would look at doing is getting a resolution together. We'll have it at the Committee of a Whole on the 8th and then um, out for passage on the um, 8th as well and then looking at having a formal dedication ceremony with the family um, at a later date. And um, for those of you that um, might not know it, uh, Councilmember Benavides served 22 years on city council. Um, yes, Mayor Shore. And I'd, I'd like to take credit for that, and I appreciate it, Councilwoman, but actually one of, uh, one of Mayor Hollister's former staffers had suggested it because we had talked about a park, and Councilwoman Washington came to me. Um, so uh, Steve Sirkayan actually suggested for that exact reason. He said, you know, Mayor Benavides was on council for many, many years, and he said it may be more appropriate, so as Councilwoman Washington said, we approached the family and they were, I think, truly touched that she had come up with that idea. And um, I think it's, it's an incredible, incredible dedication, dedication to an incredible public servant. Okay, thank you. With that, we are adjourned with Committee of the Whole and we will start in the council meeting in just a minute while we get the clerks set in. Thank you. No, they can do it um, at the beginning.